Um, and I'm also aware the other example I know of is uh, apparently there was a National Association of Parliamentarians convention uh, that happened on September 11th, 2001 in New York City. Um, so that convention had to Josh, be are you laughing at 9-11? Are you reasons. laughing at 9-11 right now, Josh? You know, dark, dark comedy, John. Um, okay. This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. Today. We're in the Wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now. As you may, you may have, I think you both have heard that I got kicked out of the Nasri Warsame press conference uh, not too long ago. Uh, a campaign person said that I was too negative about their campaign, which, which is understandable because I just had a few days earlier, I watched them chase another campaign off the stage, out the back door and out of the building. So. I do have sort of a negative perspective, but I would have been fair. I would have documented everything faithfully and accurately. I would have. I would have recorded audio and posted the whole thing, as I always do. Uh, okay, so this is the Ward 10 convention edition, post, post-convention, post maybe not post-convention, because it's, is it in recess, Devin? Correct. In recess at okay. the call of the chair. Okay, so the Ward 10 recess edition. This is like the halftime show of the Ward 10 convention, I think, is a good way to uh, to title it, maybe, of the Wedge Live podcast. I'm your host, John Edwards. My guests today are, are returning champion Josh Martin, who was at the convention, Devin Hogan, who was at the convention, in your role as former chair of the Minneapolis DFL and person doing volunteer work. Chair Emeritus. And okay. credentials uh, helper. So I ran the okay. database of all the people checking in that day. And just full disclosure, though, Devin, are you a socialist? Because I heard it was the socialists behind <laughs> what happened on Saturday. What, are you a socialist? I am a neutral party. That is my official role in the convention. Okay. So I get socialist vibes from you. But we you don't have to answer. You don't have to give me a straight answer. Okay, I, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, maybe we'll start with Josh. Josh, you always have a dispassionate and uh, very by-the-book uh, description of how things unfold. So can we start with you? You, I was talking with Devin, and we were in three different places in the building. I was right in front of the stage. You were in the back of the auditorium, so you had a better vantage point than me. Devin was in the front hallway, hallway where people were registering. Let's start with Josh. What did you see from the back of the auditorium? Let's say starting from the moment when Aisha and supporters were going to take the stage for her speech and presentation to the convention. Almost immediately upon Aisha and her supporters taking the stage, um, a lot of the Nazir Warsami delegates and visitors stood up um, and started um, booing, shouting no, shouting um, other things. Um, uh, my assumption at the initially was that this was some sort of tactic to delay or maybe prevent the speech. Um, and it wasn't immediately clear whether it would escalate from there. You know, it could have been something where they just did this for a little bit and then it died down. Um, but I think shortly after I sent my first tweet where I, I talked about how candidate speeches are supposed to be happening now, but there's um, shouting going on. I looked back up and I could see over um, at, up at the stage, there was a very different scene going on. Most of the Chugtai supporters were no longer on stage. There were Warsami supporters on stage. There was still a lot of shouting going on. Um, and it looked like Sam was uh, Sam Doton, the convention chair, was trying to regain order um, without much success. Okay, that, um, that's interesting because the way I usually do a convention is my head will be buried in my phone and I'll be listening kind of like it, I'm listening to a podcast. That's how I I hear what's happening. I don't always I don't always have my eyes up 
looking at what's going on. But because I had started taking video and could not stop taking video, I wasn't able to tweet it. And so, so do do you think you had a a clear picture of what was happening, or had you had your head head buried in your phone? I think you had a clear um, vantage point from where you were. Um, I was tweeting at one point, so I wasn't looking at the stage at that moment. Additionally, because I was further toward the back, there were a lot of people in between me and the stage, many of whom were standing up. So it was harder to see what was going on. And it was extremely hard to hear what was going on. I could not hear anything anyone on the stage was saying, including the-, the Neither chair. could I, neither could I. Oh, I was, okay. So that yeah. wasn't improved from where you were. Because, uh, well, it was probably a little better. I thought I heard, like, this This is done, everyone out of the building, this isn't safe. But I, I wasn't quite ready to believe that the whole thing was over. I, I, Me, naively, I was thinking, okay, there's been some pushing and shoving. We're all going to sit down and resume activities. I think I was wrong in that moment uh, to think that. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to go through what I what I saw maybe from a earlier point. It was a shoutier more active agitated convention than i'm used to uh going back and forth over translations a bunch in the morning uh section and i can't speak to how accurate the translations were but uh language barriers were a problem that's for sure uh and then so after the morning where there was that one contentious vote over the 78 uh delegates that aisha won with like a 60% uh, margin, which was telling about what what was to come on the endorsement vote if we had gotten that far. But after that, like we came back and things were calm in the afternoon after break. And so it's a pretty routine part of the convention where a candidate goes up with their supporters and does the presentation. Nothing is at stake. There's no vote. There's no chance for anything bad to happen to either campaign. And after those two presentations, there would have been the Q&A. So nothing is at stake. We'd gotten through the procedural stuff, the rules stuff. And uh, so I was very surprised. It was shocking to me. I didn't know what was happening. Why are people approaching the stage like this? I think I remember hearing a bunch of no's, no's uh, from people. And all, all chaos is broken loose. And eventually Aisha's campaign decides, well, it's not no longer good for us to be on this stage as people are climbing up on the stage, coming up the stairs, forcing their way past people. So they go out the back door. Eventually they decide to like lock some people in the hospitality room for safety. There's a mini standoff happening in that back hallway. Some of where supporters have come to the back hallway and there's some Aisha volunteers kind of putting their bodies there, making sure nobody gets past that. Uh, nothing, Nothing serious happened back there that I could see. And then the police show up and everyone evacuates the building. To Devin, where were you and what did you see? Yeah, so I I, I was there all day dealing with the Warsami campaign, uh, both with um, the, the kind of main four people with the purple campaign badges, plus um, a young woman who was sort of my main counterpart that I dealt with. Uh, and that was, I think, their mistake was actually having honest and smart, genuine people on their side, um, because she would repeat to me all of the lies that the campaign was feeding to their supporters, and then I would easily disprove them to her, um, and then she would then try and calm people down after they were being fed lies. And I can go so, into more detail about yeah. So tell were. tell me what what sort of lies were you being told they were telling to their supporters? So the, um, I mean, from the beginning, they were just, well, I guess we, we need to start by, by talking about, um, he had maybe 80 delegates and 40 alternates or so. So generally you, as a campaign, you're bringing 120 people plus maybe a dozen, two dozen volunteers, right? He, he brought like 400 people there. So I got to the, to the school at like 745. There's already 400 people there. There's tents set up outside. You, you arrive at, in, in that kind of situation, you're just like, well, shit, like, how is this day going to go? And right. so in the very beginning, um, so the check-in actually went extremely smooth. The credentials were, was, was perfect, in fact, throughout the day. Um, we're, we've gotten very sophisticated over the years in our ability to track people and, and measure kind of upgrading alternates and stuff. And I can talk more about what that means. But 
we asked the campaign to um, send their supporters to us 10 at a time to check in, which they did. Check in went smoothly. There was kind of a line, you know, a, there's always kind of sort of a crush, but even that, that line didn't last horribly long, maybe 10, 15 minutes at most. Um, and then, um, yeah, so then everyone's in the room. They kept demanding that these like ex extraneous 250 people be brought into the room. We were like, no, you can't do that. And they're like, what do you mean we can't do that? And it's like, they're not part of this convention. You just, you just can't bring them in. And so that's when I first started dealing with this, this young woman that I was talking about from the campaign. Um, and so she was, she had originally started the day agitated, but again, once we started to connect and, and she started to realize, oh, there's, there's more stuff going on here than what I'm being told by the campaign. She was able to, again, to work as sort of an intermediary there. So the school came to us and they're like, you got it. There's 200 people in this hallway. You can't have 200 people in this hallway. They need to get out of here. That's a fire hazard. And so I was like, yo, get these people out of here. She's like, no. Um, eventually the school sent them both up into the gym and down into the cafeteria. Um, but to me, that was the, the, the most suspicious thing is, is again, these guys running this campaign, um, specifically I'm sure the, the, um, campaign manager, plus the other people with the purple badges. Again, there's four people with these purple badges, which I think are the main perpetrators, the official campaign badges. Um, they're known people that we've seen in, in DFL spaces since like the famous incident where Ilhan was slugged in, in a ward six convention. And so these are the same people that have been around. Um, and so, I mean, they, they were sort of, I think the instigators of all of this. And again, they know better. Abshir ran right. Bernie Sanders's caucuses. So he knows better than to bring all these extraneous people. Yeah. So that's a good point about the crowd. That is one thing aside from the, the melee at the end and rushing the stage that I'd never seen before was just the mass of people outside the school when I first arrived was astonishing to me. And I was able to get through the line inside the school, like immediately, there was no line to check in, but the tents outside and all of the people outside, I was like, am I going to have to wait in this line outside the school for hours to get in? I, I guess those people weren't delegates Correct. or a lot of them were not delegates. I have never seen that before. The, just the the numbers of people who were there that I didn't realize weren't even delegates or alternates. Yeah, and and I noticed that more, and I noticed that especially inside the auditorium. You know, the the visitors and alternate section is mainly a handful of alternates, uh, me, and some campaign volunteers, and that's about it. It's main. It's mainly Josh Martin and John Edwards in the visitor section of <laughs> convention. No, nobody is interested in spending their day inside a school auditorium ever. Devin, where should we pick up your side of the story? From? So the other thing that was suspicious as well was before the convention, I was on uh, not all, but but at least half of the planning meetings that took place. Is the campaign didn't send anyone to these these planning meetings, and so. Normally, if you're a serious campaign, you send your people to these planning meetings because you want to have influence in how the convention is run because you care. And so the fact that they didn't send anyone either meant they didn't care or like they just were up to something, I guess. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, but so so that again, so those are the two main suspicious things that you bring all these extra people. These people are demanding to be brought into the to the space. The space is not literally big enough for all of these people and they're not supposed to be there to begin with. So right. and um, I, I think it's important to emphasize again, what you said about his campaign manager work for Bernie Sanders in Iowa, which is like the caucus capital of the universe. So the idea that he wouldn't know there's no point to bringing all these extraneous people uh, to the convention. He knew. And I feel bad because these are people who I don't know what exactly they're told, but it's something along the lines of, Hey, come support this guy, come support this handsome young man. And like, they're sure they're like, sure. I'll go support this guy. And generally in a convention, um, there's a lot of first time convention goers that are like, Hey, I'm here to support someone. And then they're like, Oh God, why am I sitting through two hours of nonsense? I'm just literally here to support someone. And so, you know, coupling, not speaking English to that and then coupling, well, you're not allowed in this room where the support is happening, even though like, a proper campaign would have a not brought them to begin with or b you know more accurately explained how they could support them which again this young woman i dealt with 
she the way she talked to the supporters she was like yo we're going to celebrate anyways go sit in the gym it'll be great we're going to celebrate no matter what the outcome is and so like i said that was their fatal flaw was actually having honest and, and genuine people also working for that their campaign who sort of let the mask slip but so um the the, there's a lot of like um, back and forth about upgrading alternates. And so for people that don't know what that means, basically the each each precinct is allowed a certain number of delegates in the delegation. And there's the reason that number is set by what's called a candidate average vote, which is something the DNC, it's a formula the DNC has about the strength of people that vote for Democrats in that particular precinct. And so when that precinct isn't full, um, there's alternates that can be then be made delegates depending on whichever delegates didn't show up for the day. Again, we have a very sophisticated credential system. I wrote down the names of all of the alternates that needed to be upgraded. There were only four precincts that had alternates. Um, I gave the sheets to the Warsami campaign to this young woman. I was like, go find these people, tell them to come out here. We'll give them their, their blue badge, their delegate badge. She did that, found every single one of them, brought them out. We gave them their badge. They went back in five minutes later. The whole, every single alternate is now in the hallway being like, yo, they just told me I can get uh, my blue badge. Where's my blue badge? Why aren't you, you you giving me my blue badge? And I was like, hey, we literally just did this. We worked with the campaign to do this. And then they kept insisting that we we upgraded all of Aisha's delegates. We, we basically gave all of the open spaces to Aisha's people and none to Warsami's people, which again, can easily be proven by going through the sheet and showing the, the actual people and so um, I show, again show this to this young woman, and then one of the four campaign people with the purple badges came out screaming all this stuff. She had a um, bullhorn at this point, screaming in the ears of Latanya. Um, and I was like, yo, stop screaming at me. I will literally show you this. And so she still screamed for a bit. Finally, I showed her this, and then she went and started screaming these same lies over and over again. I do want to pause and say, like, mega, mega big props to Latanya. I don't know if you guys saw her. She was the woman mm -hmm. in the purple vet or the pink vest. She she was one of the sergeant at arms and just like deserves a, a, a medal of honor. I swear to God for for because people everyone's screaming in her ear and she's just like not taking nonsense, so, trying to help people talk it out, all that kind of stuff. So Devin, are you talking about stuff? So I caught Latanya on video in the middle of it in the convention hall. And what you're talking about is stuff that happened in that front hallway. Latanya was also like in the middle of it out there. Yeah. Yep. Everywhere. In the middle of it everywhere, all the time. Just all day long. Just just taking it and, and just taking it like a champ. Just being awesome. So so God bless her. I mean, she she above and beyond. So one thing I was thinking, I I don't think I was as phased by it in the moment, but like when you're in the middle of something like that and there's pushing and shoving and people are larger than you and there's a lot of them, it can stress you out. Even if no one throws a punch, like your heart rate goes up, who knows what your age and ability level is. If you have health conditions, it's dangerous when things like this happen, like someone can fall and hit their head. Anything can happen when stuff like this breaks out and... Like, fortunately, I don't think anyone was seriously injured, but it was a very dangerous situation. Uh, I, I just think that that's uh, maybe was not clear to me in the moment. It's very clear to me now. That was a very dangerous situation. Someone that was on the stage had a torn rotator cuff. So I would call that. So that's not been reported out yet, but that, that was definitely a serious injury. And so I guess just to finish up my my perspective is I was out in the hallway when one of the sergeant at arms ran out and was like, Devin, Devin, get in here immediately. And I was like, okay, someone's waving their arm saying, get in here. I get in there. And what had happened was um, for people that weren't there, it's a school auditorium. There's, there's like three aisles and we had some chairs set up in the aisles delineating between delegates sit in front of this. Everyone else sits behind it. The reason why we separate people like that is because the, the people who are allowed to vote need to be separated in order for the ballots to be handed out and all of that to be done correctly. The big thing, the big breakdown in the 2018 Senate District Convention was that everyone had gone through credentials and then no, no, then they went into the room without having been fully. So they go through the process of getting credentials and then go into the room where there's no one actually separating the people who can vote from the people who can't vote. 
And so when you tell the people who had just gone through this line, you need to get out of the room and do this over again, they flip out. And that, that's how that one ended. So we were, we were very much, we were very intentional this time in, in being very obvious as to where people were supposed to sit. And so the person, the sergeant at arms who flagged me down was like this woman who was, who was standing in front of those chairs was like a small woman, you know, five feet tall, something like that. And um, the person, and so she's just being mobbed. People are just walking, running through the, pushing through. And the sergeant who had come and got me had literally been run over and like knocked over. And, and, and so she was like physically shaking. She was so upset. And so, um, so all these people, it, it, I heard the boos. It, so I was in there pretty quickly. Um, I saw still, there were still Aisha people filing up on stage when the, when the rush had happened. And so, um, you start to see her people, her meaning Aisha's people who were just there, like it was any normal convention, just be like, well, screw this, get up and leave. And so we had to help like escort some elderly people out as this crush is coming to the stage. And everyone's like, and then I stood in the chairs and I see you, John. I was like, oh, there's John with his video camera. This is about to go on the internet and the whole internet's going to find out what's happening here. And, um, and everyone's looking at me. I'm like, it's over. Get out of here. This is done. This, you can't come back from this. And that's so, so that was, so that was kind of weird. But then once people started pushing towards the stage and getting up on stage, that's when it crossed from ridiculous to dangerous. And so you see these people like getting on stage, pulling the mic from each other. Um, and one of the, the women, again, with the purple campaign badge, getting up and banging the table. I, she was throwing, you know, papers around in, in Sam's parliamentary procedure book. I thought she was literally going to flip the table off the stage. It was insane. Right. So uh, Southwest Voices story reported that the police have been called at 1230, which is roughly the time we had broken for lunch and prayers. And so... Do you know where that happened? Was that in your presence out in that front hallway? Where? What's that about? Nope. You don't know? Nope. And it was quiet then, because like you said, yeah, lunch. Josh, did you, uh, did you see any assaults? Apart from the thing in front of the stage, you didn't see any uh, assaults. I, I, I did not witness any assaults. Um, uh, and as for the, the 1230 thing, yeah, that was a surprise to me as well, because um, it was fairly calm in the auditorium at that time. I do remember at some point there seemed to be some sort of commotion um, near near the back hallways, um, but I don't know if that was related or not. There were commotions throughout the day, so and I don't recall exactly when that was. There was a point right before I left the auditorium to go on break when I saw a friend of mine who works for or is was helping Aisha's campaign, uh, getting into it with in a heated conversation with several women. And I was like, should I go over there? That that looks like it could potentially escalate. I didn't go over there because uh, I just figured I, it wouldn't help. But there were there were moments like that where you think, well, that looks like a heated conversation. Yeah, I, I definitely noticed a lot of what seemed to be. And it's not unusual to see representatives from campaigns talking to each other throughout a convention, usually negotiating different things. Um, these were more tense conversations or appeared to be more tense conversations than what I normally see. And it wasn't even like a negotiation style conversation. It felt to me like it was a let's calm down here. Let's uh, deescalate. Let's let's not uh, let's clear up whatever it is you seem to be confused about kind of thing. I figured we would go through uh, what the various campaigns are saying about what happened. Uh, and the message from Aisha's campaign is consistent with what I saw. And I like I can't vouch for all the injuries and assaults because it was just a mob scene. But like, it's clear there was one campaign storming the stage and another campaign retreating. And I did see Aisha's campaign de-escalating, moving people away, getting them away from danger. They were very diligent about that. I think that's just indisputable from my perspective. They were chased off the stage into that back hallway. Uh, they were locking people in the hospitality room. I, I did see that to keep them safe, waiting for police. Devin, are you aware of anything Aisha's campaign is saying that I have not included here? Yeah, so the hallway thing. Um, I So after the convention broke down, um, there were, and so as you said, like Sam said, clear, clear, the, clear the building. Um, so that was the one like thing I could actually clearly hear from the stage. 
And so I just started wandering the hallways, seeing if people would clear the building. I ended up in the back hallway behind the auditorium, which is where the two campaign rooms were. Aisha's was on one side of the building and, and Nasri's was on the other. And um, there are a lot of people claiming at that point that, that Jeremiah Ellison had beaten up Abshir, um, Nasri's campaign manager. And I was like, well, that sounds ridiculous because that's just not how Jeremiah is. He's just, he's, that's not his personality at all. And so, um, and so then I see this like line of yellow Aisha people and they're just standing in the hallway, like physically separating these two groups. And so um, I was going over there to kind of check it on their campaign and kind of see what was happening when basically there was a second kind of confrontation, a storm of people kind of pushing front again. And so I turned around and like became part of this human chain in the hallway. And this, this one woman who I hadn't, I don't remember necessarily seeing her throughout the day. So I don't know if she was officially, um, with the campaign or not, but just like kept insisting, she kept like going after Jeremiah to calling him out by name and like trying to chase after him to the point where she tried to like knock us down like bowling pins. And so I was like, okay, I need to like physically remain here. And otherwise these people are going to chase, like knock down these delegates and try and attack these people. Like that was in my mind, that felt the most like dangerous part of the day was the, the people were still worked up and like, literally trying to chase after these other people. And so, and what, what I found most annoying and upsetting about the initial reporting was like fights breaking out. It's, and as it, as we've all just mentioned earlier, like we've seen fights break out. It's not, this was not a fight breaking out. People were like out of control, emotional. And so how do you get that level of worked up unless you've been pumped full of lies all day? And which is why I think the baby J six moniker is, is such a, um, so apt in, in a lot of ways, because like there's different, there's a, all these different levels of things that are going on. Um, and the main thing is like the people who were in charge knew what they were doing and were um, utilizing that to, to take advantage of people and their emotions. And so, so again, that's, what's upsetting about it to me is like just seeing these people getting lied to all day, having an easy response to these lies only for them to be lied to even more. And so of course they're going to get upset because they've been told all day that there's all this cheating, that, you know, all these people are out to get them and they showed up and they're not allowed to participate. But the campaign told them that if they showed up, they could participate, that kind of stuff. There's also been the suggestion from Warsame's side that because elected officials were present who were Aisha's supporters that there is somehow something corrupt about that. That is a normal convention it's, thing is you bring your high profile supporters to say to the convention, Hey, look at me. you know me? You trust me, uh, support my candidate. That is a thing that happens at every convention. We've seen Jacob Fry's people show up for his preferred city council candidates, just a normal thing for council members, the mayor, county commissioners, uh, whoever the, I think the sheriff, was that Ward 13? Do she I was that? at Ward 13, yep. So, like, public fig figures show up to these things. It's not a it's not a sign that things were rigged. It's just a sign that these are my high-profile supporters. It's a political convention. This is what happens. Uh, should we move on to what the Warsame campaign is saying? This is going to be fun. Josh, I hope you have your greatest hits lined up for what the Warsame campaign is saying. Uh, my favorite one, I, I don't really have a favorite. They are all excellent. If you'd brought, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't have direct quotes here, but basically like the DFL wasn't providing enough security. And I interpret this to mean if you'd brought more security, I wouldn't have so easily overrun your security. Uh, that's, that's how I interpret that. Uh, there's the one about Jeremiah Ellison assaulting someone, which seems... Uh, wrong to me. I can't say I had my eyes on Jeremiah Ellison the whole time, but Aisha was going, was very likely going to get the endorsement. There's no reason for anyone on Aisha's side to have been worked up. Uh, and so I don't know why, Jer what motivates Jeremiah Ellison to assault someone? I don't know what that would be. Uh, Self-defense? Uh, we shouldn't speculate because I I doubt very much that he assaulted anyone. There's video evidence that he didn't, and Chief well, O'Hara has that. Well, that's good. Uh, it was the socialists. Here's another one. It was the socialists who did it. Uh, I think this is one designed to appeal to older white people. 
It feels like red meat for them. It was the socialists who did it. Uh, and uh, Josh, I think you made this point to me. Socialists volunteer. Uh, they are young, young socialists are volunteering at political conventions across the city on a regular basis. Yeah, that is also a normal thing to see. And they, yeah. they often support one or the other of the candidates. It's just like it's very difficult for them to, like, rig the process because you know, had some socialist volunteers. I don't I don't buy into this conspiracy. Correct. I, you know, I would compare it to being a, being a convention volunteer as opposed to like a volunteer for the campaigns. A computer can't volunteer for the convention itself. Uh, it's kind of like being an election judge in many ways. And that's something you and I have both done, John. We might still have our own opinions about the election, but we don't let those opinions sway us right. throughout the day. And that's the same thing for, for volunteers at a convention. There are, um, there the are people looking thing. over your shoulder. If you do something, there's like five people looking over your shoulder. Wow, this person really messed up. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what's going on here, but you will be caught. And, yeah, and we encourage um, all sorts of people. We encourage volunteers representing both campaigns so they can um, keep an eye on each other. They know there's no funny business going on. There's rules that provide that there's a representative from each campaign in the room counting the ballots so they can observe that process. Um, so to the extent there's some concern about volunteers who may or may not support one side involved, then the the logical solution to that is to get supporters from your side involved as volunteers as well, which they're welcome to do. The DFL conventions are volunteer run and they need as many volunteers as they can get. I was going to say the strongest and most consistent volunteers for the DFL party under the age of 50 are all socialists. So that's the other unspoken thing is like the most hardcore Democrats are the socialists. So we're they're, they're, they yeah. they believe in the It's your 10. volunteer base. It's yeah, city council campaigns, the progressive city council campaigns in Minneapolis are fueled by a lot of socialist volunteers. So uh, the last one here is this is kind of a normal one and maybe the most believable uh, from the Warsaw May campaign. Uh, volunteers quoted in a Fox 9 story saying that when Aisha and her people had gone up on stage, they had been told that was her basically her declaring victory like it was over. And out of shock and dismay at things having been rigged, uh, they that's what precipitated it. I don't so I don't have it clear in my mind the translations that were given prior. I remember it going I remember an announcement in English at least that like we're gonna do a random draw to decide who goes up on the stage and candidates are gonna present. I don't know if that was translated uh, adequately. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, and just to be clear, and, and we know this, it is it is very normal for supporters to go on stage when a can candidate gives a nominating yeah. speech. But if you're someone who is attending a convention for the first time and there are some language um, and translation issues, completely understandable that they might not know that. Um, so uh, this seems like a reasonably plausible explanation, um, particularly if... Um, Perhaps there was some misleading information given by the campaign to some of the volunteers. I remember not being familiar with conventions, and I don't think I would have jumped to that conclusion unless someone had suggested to me that was what was happening. So I don't know. Maybe if you build up that level of mistrust and confusion over the course of a day, you might jump to that conclusion. I don't know. Uh, uh, Devin, do you have any reactions to the Warsa May campaigns, uh, various uh reasons for to say to justify what happened i i do think that it explains the booing perhaps you know but i don't know that it that explains the rushing the stage which then led into actual shoving matches you know and again the video very clearly shows one side shoving the other and the other side walking away while it's happening and so um I mean yeah i don't think it's implausible that that people were confused and upset by by the the presentation of, of their opponent and not, not knowing what was going on, but how that spilled over is, is another question. Uh, what, what comes next, I guess? Maybe that's a good question for you as the former chair of the Minneapolis DFL. Sure. So um, I do want to actually give extreme kudos to Ken Martin, chair of the state party, for taking this seriously and um, and unequivocally calling out what happened, which is that 
one campaign precipitated this event and, and caused a lot of the mayhem. Um, and so the, the, the DFL put out two statements on the day that it happened. Um, the first statement was a little more equivocal because Ken was out of the country and just wasn't around. Um, but the second statement named the Warsami campaign as the perpetrators. And then he personally said that he would call the state executive committee, which is the governing body of the DFL in between state conventions to come up with a bylaw and, and ban all of these people. And so that is a huge, huge, huge thing because, um, this is unacceptable. And so, um, so I think that's huge. The meeting is happening the day, the day after tomorrow is when it's happening. I'm not a member of this body, so I'm not going to be there, but I, I am appreciative that they're taking it seriously. The next steps I think are then going to be decided by that body, um, including a possible reconvening of the convention. I mean, I have my own personal thoughts about that. I'll not get into that now, I guess. Um, the, the uh, most we're, important... we're going to be online. Are we going to be online, Devin? Come on, tell me. I have no idea. No, the, no. I mean more personally, like, do we reconvene the convention? Do we go through an endorsement process anyways? That kind of thing. And I think yeah, that... I mean, one of the options is it would be an online uh, reconvening, right? Is that one right. option? Yeah, that's one option. So basically, they would reconvene the convention, which is what we did in SD62 in 2018, is we reconvene the convention to conduct the business, which was elect... Um, we didn't do the endorsement that time, but we did elect the state central committee or the state um, convention delegates. So yeah, so it could be reconvened either in person or online. I would imagine there's no appetite for a, an in-person reconvening, but considering the only thing left to do because it's in recess, all the rules have already been decided, the delegates are already, the challenges are already done, all that stuff is done. All you would do is continue the speeches and have the vote. The question is, is will or Sami be kicked out of the party and therefore ineligible to run, that I think would make the reconvening go a lot faster. Uh, well, now that his campaign manager is making uh, allegations against Jeremiah Ellison that are maybe not credible, that are also in conflict with what was said on social media by Warsame on the day it happened. It was that a Aisha like, volunteer had assaulted his campaign manager. I'm guessing they know what Jeremiah Ellison looks like. And if it had been Jeremiah Ellison, they would have said so. And they wouldn't have just said it, Aisha campaign volunteer. Um, another thing I'm thinking about is the storyline that came out of it. Uh, aside from the both sides thing, like this was a mutual uh, altercation, which it wasn't, is the like trying to fit it into like angry politics or like the coarsening of the discourse. Like we just, we hate each other. We're at each other's throats. I think that's not right. I was asked by an AP reporter, like, well, it looked like Aisha's supporters were white and Nasri's supporters are all Somali. That's what it looks like in the video. And I, I, I like, I don't buy, this is not like a racial, there's no racial, uh, animus in Ward 10. Of course, racism is real. I'll concede to that. But like, we're not at each other's throats. I, this is not emblematic of some wider problem in Ward 10, because there's basically been no campaign happening in Ward 10. I have not heard from this guy. Uh, there is no campaign. He just brought a lot of people to a convention. And like, due to his poor leadership or active uh, chicanery, just like uh, blew the process up. That's what happened. I mean, yeah, I just, I would agree with you is all I would say. And that like, in, in relation to that too, um, the, 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 the goal, right. Of, so there was no campaign. There's no campaign happening. The candidate can't even spell his own name, right. On his liter on his like logo. So like, this is not a serious person. Um, who's who's trying to do a serious job. So where did he come from? Why is he running? And there's a lot of unserious people that run all the time, but they're never, ever, ever at this level of organization. So so who's putting him up to this? Where is the money coming from? Um, right. And like... The Here will be something near and dear to Josh's heart. There's been no campaign finance report filed correct. for uh, Nasri Warsame. Had enough money to print the signs and bring all the tents to the front yard. It's a $750 spend threshold that requires you to register a campaign. 
There is no registration for Nasri Warsame. We we just we don't know uh, uh, anything about that aspect of his campaign, and it's legally required. Yeah. So because of that, we we don't know who is financing the campaign, um, and uh, that uh, campaign finance report is required to include information about. Um, overall uh, money raised and spent uh, requires itemized expenditures, um, and it also requires itemized donations for the donations that are over $100 um, over the course of a year from a single person. So um, if he was, for instance, funded by a, a handful of, of large donations, then um, the campaign finance report would show that. Uh, or, or you could just lie on your campaign finance report. Who's going to check? <laughs> that's the other option it's like i i look at campaign finance reports all the time I'm like well you could just lie who really who is going to check this stuff nobody even complains when someone fails to file uh, can, josh can you explain the process maybe we can encourage more campaign finance watchdogs out there to to do some watchdogging what is the process for complaining about something you see wrong on a campaign finance report so campaign finance reports um, issues at the local level are enforced by the Minnesota Office of Administrative Hearings. Um, and there's a location on their website where people can file um, a complaint regarding um, some sort of campaign finance violation. Another interesting thing is Warsame has registered his campaign as an LLC. Uh, that's weird. I don't think you're required to do that. Okay. Yeah, no, I... No one seems to have any explanation for why that happened. <laughs> it's one of those things where you're like, this campaign is very confused. But again, they have a very experienced campaign manager. So what is going on here? It's a, it's a shame that we have to waste so much time talking about this because this is not a credible campaign that's going to be able to win or be competitive. I've heard people speculate this is a cash grab in some way or a way to build profile. And it's a tremendous waste of time, and it created a dangerous situation at the convention. And uh, But it sure is fun to talk about, isn't it, guys? <laughs> the thing, though, too, is, like, he, he has legitimate supporters. Like, I've t I talked to them. I had good conversations with them about policy and political differences. Like, that is the purpose of a convention. Someone, uh, Luke, wrote that it was they should be carnivals of democracy, which I thought was such a great description. And so, I mean, these people got cheated too. Not, you know, they they legitimately believe in this guy and, and what he stands for. But they're, I mean, he, will he even file to run? Like, I think you know the the evidence is such so bad against him at this point. He may be just chased out of the race altogether. Yeah, you know, you know what's a shame, and I hate to be the guy, uh, the convention, the political convention booster, the caucus and convention uh, booster here. But I've enjoyed the conventions I've been to in 2023. I don't know if it's like being back with people in person and seeing a lot of people, you know, that you haven't seen in a long time. I have enjoyed the in-person convention process, and I feel like th this really tarnishes it and makes it less likely to happen again in the future. Uh, you have any thoughts, Josh? You go to a lot of conventions. Have you been enjoying yourself? Um, certainly, I think as a... You know, there's advantages to the in-person and advantages to the online. I would certainly say as an observer, I do enjoy it more in person. I get to talk to people sometimes. People stop by and say hi. Um, I get to see the um, everything going on in, in the hall. Um, whereas on a Zoom convention, I'm just sitting at my computer, like, watching things slowly happen. Um, yeah. So... Um, there's some advantages to certainly to virtual as well. Um, you can attend from the comfort of your own home and take breaks at your leisure. You have access to your pets if you have pets. Um, so I don't know. There's pluses and, and minuses to both, certainly. Um, uh, but of all the reasons why to choose virtual over in person, I think we certainly never hoped that this would be one of the reasons we would have to opt for virtual conventions. Devin, are we at risk? Uh, is this make it less likely that we have in-person conventions in the future? Does this hurt the cause of the in-person convention? Not necessarily, um, but I will say this: this whole thing was successful. I think in the people who did that on purpose to call it into question. 
um, something you had, uh, some, some, some news you had broken back in March was when the landlords were doing polling around rent control. And one of the, and so in, in polls, you, you're always, you're always asking these other favorability questions. What's your opinion on Joe Biden? What's your opinion on Jacob Fry, on Chief O'Hara, on all this other stuff? And one of the things they asked was, what was your favorability opinion of the Minneapolis DFL? So why on earth, why on earth is, is the landlord lobby asking these questions? And so why, why are they interested in knowing such a thing? Um, it strikes me as suspicious, especially because we know from polling that Jacob Fry is very unpopular. And so why are, why are his allies um, asking about um, the local political party trying to find out its popularity? So I find that very suspicious. And, and I think directly related to the, the purpose of, of the baby J6. And so, um, so I think there's, there's some, there might be some question about it, but like ultimately no, because there are a lot of advantages to um, in-person, including that it can actually go faster than virtual. So I'm pretty proud of um, hosting the shortest convention in possibly Minneapolis history, um, 20 minutes start to finish, um, for Ward One, and so that's that, so. I'm always of the of the opinion that conventions don't need to be terrible. They can be fun. They can be exciting. Like sometimes they have to go long, but you can make it. You can make that space entertaining. Um, I, I'm. It's really too bad during my tenure we weren't able to put on an in-person convention, um, but because I had a lot of ideas, the majority of the Minneapolis DFL work is actually around the school board, and so we can get speech clubs, you know, or speech team students come up and give performances while there's downtime. We can have uh, students DJ. We can, we can do all sorts of fun stuff to take up time. But at the same time, too, it doesn't have to take up time. So, like, Ward 2 was uncontested. It took 43 minutes to um, elect their two ward representatives and, and not endorse anyone. Ward 9 was uncontested. Um, and it took two hours, even though it was online. And Ward 1 was uncontested, and it took 20 minutes. And not only did it take 20 minutes, they raised more money than, than Ward 3. And so I thought that was a pretty brilliant conceit. I think you were there, Josh, for, for Ward 1? I was there for Ward 1. And yeah, um, uh, the SD60 chair um, specifically uh, raised a challenge to, to delegates to try to raise more money than Ward 3. And uh, it sounds like they were successful in that. They beat him by 100 bucks. Uh, Josh, here's a question for you. What kind of deranged weirdo goes to an uncontested convention in Ward 1? You know, um, there were, I think, a little over 100 delegates in Ward 1, which, yeah, did seem like high to me, considering that the, the outcome was pretty much decided from the get-go. So it seemed to be a lot of people who were very enthusiastic about the incumbent, Elliot Payne, um, and were there on a, you know, was that Saturday, Saturday, yeah, Saturday morning to support him? Well, I, I guess it's probably because I know a lot of people who go to these things, and that's what makes it fun for me. I could see how if you don't know anyone, it would be the most painful experience of your life because there is no one to socialize with. Should we do? Re are any of you interested in doing recommendations? This is a thing I do at the end of the episode. I don't know if it's that kind of episode, but if you have recommendations, this is your chance to offer them. Devin, what what sort of recommendations do you mean? Literally anything, anything you like. What do you like that you think other people should do, or play, or read, or listen to, or experience? It could be a place, a movie, anything you could recommend that someone who's listening could take up. It would make them happy. Yeah, I just found out about this um, spiral of pine trees near uh, what's it, uh, Cedar Lake. I haven't been there yet, but I saw someone post about it online. It's I forget what it's even dedicated to. I'll have to take a look. Um, but yeah, that's so on the north side of Cedar Lake is uh, I think it's dedicated to existential philosophy or something. But I would recommend checking that out um, in the, the summer. The other thing I would recommend is, is learning some of the more fun esoteric things about Robert's rules of order. Um, so something I actually learned out of this whole situation is that, um, so what's cool about Robert's rules in, in political conventions is that the, the convention body, the people that are in the room, um, are the ones governing the convention. The chair is just the one facilitating what the people in the room want. 
And so if the people in the room want to end the convention, they can say, I, I vote that we end the convention and you can take a vote and whatever. However, Robert's Rules also allows for the chair to unilaterally end the convention in, in case of a riot. And so that 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 is there's solid legal, not legal, but, you know, parliamentary um, uh, reasoning for the chair to recess the convention in, in the situation that this happened. So so I invite people to learn some of the more esoteric things um, to bring to the next DFL convention and, and try and stump our, our parliamentarians on their knowledge. Pretty amazing that Robert's Rules anticipated a riot at your boring Robert's Rules thing. Yeah. Uh, Josh, do you have any uh, parliamentarian recommendations? You are a professional parliamentarian, so I'm sure you knew that thing about ending a, uh, an event in case of a riot, didn't you? Yeah, and that ended up coming in handy for me because I couldn't hear a thing that was going on, but I was able, through my parliamentary procedure knowledge, to correctly surmise what had happened. Um, so yeah, there is a rule in Robert's Rules that says, in the event of fire, riot, or other extreme emergency, if the chair believes taking time for a vote on adjourning would be dangerous to those present, he should declare the meeting adjourned to a suitable time and place for an adjourned meeting if he is able or to meet at the call of the chair. Hmm. Um, I, I've never seen that happen before, personally. Um, I am aware of some other instances. Apparently there was one other DFL convention where something similar happened. Um, and I'm also aware the other example I know of is uh, apparently there was a National Association of Parliamentarians convention uh, that happened on September 11th, 2001 in mm. New York City. Um, so that convention had to Josh, be are you laughing at 9-11? Are you reasons. laughing at 9-11 right now? Josh? You know, dark, dark comedy, John. Um, okay. Other parliamentary procedure nerdery that I looked up was uh, about the Nasri Warsami campaign's claim about the, the delegates not being, potentially not being able to vote on their own challenge. And I went through the um, a pretty detailed analysis of why I think that's not the case when you um, try to challenge that many delegates en masse and whether it's even appropriate to do that. Um, Non-parliamentary procedure stuff. Um, so I was at the convention. Um, my girlfriend was also at the convention as a Ward 10 delegate. It was her first convention, so not the best. You're breaking first a lot. You're breaking experience. a lot of hearts here, Josh. You're breaking a lot of hearts. <laughs> um, and uh, after the convention, we were you know a little shaken up. Uh, so later that night, we wanted to watch some some lighthearted TV to unwind. Um, so we watched a little bit of Ted Lasso, uh, which I'm sure everybody knows about, um, and also a little bit of this show called Schmigadoon, which is about this couple that uh, goes off uh, into some sort of alternate dimension where it's basically a 1950s musical, um, and it's, a, it's an interesting show. Well, uh, thank you both for being here. I think this is very educational. Uh, I enjoyed it. Devin Hogan... Who are you still with the Minneapolis DFL? Chair Emeritus, Emeritus. is that what I have to call you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Josh Martin, who is Parliamentarian Emeritus of the Wedge Live podcast. And, have uh, I been I, replaced? Uh, oh, yeah, I guess Emeritus <laughs> means you've been replaced. No, we don't have, you can be Emeritus and, uh, you know, a Parliamentarian. I don't know. I don't understand what these words mean. <laughs> I'm your host, John Edwards, and this has been the Wedge Live podcast. Thank you for listening. This is a real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. Stop this. I've got plenty of time. I have nothing else going on today. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now. 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 Right now.